2007 Alice Louise Reynolds Women in Scholarship Lecture. I'm Randy Olson, the University Librarian and Director of the Harold B. Lee Library. It is our distinct pleasure to have with us today Professor Martha Peacock from the Department of Visual Arts, who will deliver an address entitled Heroines, Harpies, and Housewives, Women of Consequence in the Dutch Golden Age. We'll hear more about Professor Peacock in just a moment. The Alice Louise Reynolds Women in Scholarship Lecture is a memorial to one of BYU's most outstanding female scholars. Professor Reynolds was the first woman to teach college-level li college level literature classes at Brigham Young Academy, and when it became BYU, she was the first woman to become a full professor. The Harold B. Lee Library can trace its beginnings to a committee on which Professor Reynolds served, first as a member and then as a chair for 19 years. As a student and teacher of comparative literature, she devoted many years to fulfilling the dream of a large and comprehensive university library at BYU. She was instrumental in raising funds to purchase all 1,200 volumes of Provo Judge Whitcotton's large and diverse personal library, which was the nucleus around which the Harold B. Lee Library has grown. At her death in 1938, the library had expanded to 100,000 volumes. Today's library of nearly 4 million volumes stands as a perpetual memorial to her, her, to her vision and dedication. To honor this remarkable scholar, teacher, and friend of the library, the Alice Louise Reynolds Women in Scholarship Lecture was established recognizing the contributions of outstanding female scholars at Brigham Young University. We have designated a room in the Harold B. Lee Library as the Alice Louise Reynolds Conference Room, in which hangs framed posters of the Women in Scholarship Lectures since 2004. It is through the generosity of the now defunct Alice Louise Reynolds Club and current friends of the library that an endowment for this lectureship is made possible. Following Professor Peacock's address, we'll be pleased to have a brief question and answer session. And now to today's featured speaker. Martha M. Peacock earned a baccalaureate degree at BYU in 1978 and an MA and PhD, degree, D, PhD degrees from The Ohio State University in 1985 and 1989, respectively. She returned to BYU to teach art history in 1987 and currently holds the rank of professor. In her published work of nearly two dozen articles, chapters, and encyclopedia entries, Professor Peacock has examined the role of women in Dutch art and the portrayal of women in the artistic works of Northern European painters. She has been a curator of BYU of exhibitions on Rembrandt and is a principal in the 2010 exhibition of Rembrandt's mid-17th century work entitled The Head of Christ at Museums in Philadelphia and Detroit. Throughout her career, she has delivered papers and presentations to conferences at the University of Padua in Italy, in Antwerp, Belgium, at the Annual Conference of Art Historians in London, and at various universities across North America. In conjunction with her passion for her discipline, Professor Peacock is an apt role model and compassionate mentor to a younger generation of art historians. Professor Peacock and her husband Greg are the parents of five children, Justin, Byron, Andrea, Alex, and Laura. A gifted teacher, she is a mentor in the spirit and mold of Professor Reynolds and embodies the desirable attributes of faithful scholarship for which Alice Louise Reynolds is most famous. It is with a great deal of appreciation the library is pleased to introduce today the 2007 Alice Louise Reynolds Women in Scholarship Lecturer, Professor Martha Peacock. Thank you so much, and thank you for coming. I appreciate the support, and 
I really need to start this lecture by saying thanks to all my family who came today and uh, for their love and support throughout my life and to my great husband who has just uh, been a marvelous um, help me and an individual who's listened to all of my ideas and commented and critiqued them and uh, so a lot of this scholarship is due to his help and support. I thought I'd start out today by giving you a little bit of background uh, to the Netherlands. It's been interesting to get emails from people all across campus today saying, now is this Norway or you know Denmark or what, what's Dutch? And <laughs> so it's been kind of a, a, an interesting um, uh, start to this to realize that I needed to prepare you a little bit about the Dutch Golden Age. Uh, we essentially see this beginning in the late uh, part of the 16th century, but uh, mostly through the 17th century. Uh, this happens because the Netherlands, uh, which at that point in time encompassed today modern day Holland and Belgium, um, uh, in that time was all called the Lowlands or the Netherlands and belonged to the old Holy Roman Empire. In the 16th century, the empire splits into an Eastern and Western uh, portion and the uh, western portion, including Spain and the Netherlands, uh, was given to Philip II, who was an extremely devout Catholic king. This is the time of the Inquisition. This is the time of the Jesuits. And uh, the Netherlands, which was becoming increasingly Protestant then at the end of the 16th century, had real problems with this very uh, um, intensely Catholic king. And um, in the year 1566, riots broke out in Antwerp in which the Protestants were going into the churches, the Catholic churches, and destroying images of art, uh, that, what are called the iconoclastic riots. Uh, because Calvin, uh, the Protestant leader who had established a community down in Geneva, Switzerland, uh, decided that this was worshiping icons and therefore we shouldn't have art in the churches. And so uh, these riots then uh, ended up destroying quite a bit of art. Well, Philip decided he wasn't going to let them get away with that, so he sends up troops. Well, in those days, to send up a whole tr uh, set of troops to the Netherlands took about a year. And by that point in time, the riots had quelled and so on. Uh, but he came up to get vengeance on those Protestants who had destroyed those images. And so uh, war breaks out, and uh, uh, the Duke of Alva sends in his troops into various parts of the northern Netherlands and holds sieges on various cities, Harlem, Alkmaar, Leiden, and so on, uh, trying to starve the people into submission. Uh, but they absolutely decided they wanted their freedom more, and uh, so they held out, at times even flooding a city so that the Spanish couldn't get it. And eventually the Spaniards give up, and they decide to just take the lower part of the Netherlands, or what's essentially Belgium today, and uh, the seven United Provinces form their own independent Dutch Republic, which was really our first sort of early modern democracy. Uh, they had a prince, uh, William of Orange, but he was uh, really just uh, a sort of titular head, and primarily the people ruled themselves. Now, you can imagine what changes had to take place in this new Protestant, middle-class, democratic uh, society, uh, doing away with monasteries, um, uh, doing away with the idea that a celibate life was the most virtuous life. They had to now find new ways to celebrate the ideologies of, uh, of this new republic. And so they gathered together a set of heroes and heroines from this, uh, from this revolt against Spain, uh, throwing off this yoke of oppression, starting a new Calvinist state, and Calvinism became the official uh, religion, the Reformed Church. And uh, they now established a new culture that instead celebrated family life, uh, raising of good little burgers and burgeresses to carry on the middle class democratic tradition. Uh, children that needed to be schooled in the home now rather than in monasteries and so on. Um, and it, it, they, I love the Dutch word, in fact I've been having great fun uh, speaking with a Dutch native here up front uh, for the last few minutes. Um, uh, learning about this uh, spirit of, uh, of what the Dutch call chaselikheid or this uh, attachment to home and family and coziness and um, and so this new ideology begins to take over in this new culture and in this culture because of this dramatic revolutionary change that had taken place uh, it meant that women could take on new and different roles as well 
And interestingly, uh, a lot of research, uh, comparative research been, has been conducted over the roles of women in this society. They had more rights under the law. They could uh, own and inherit property, run businesses. Uh, they could uh, sit with the men in church. Uh, they uh, actually uh, seem to have been a rather powerful uh, group of individuals. And so uh, these women, more and more attention began to be paid to women and to their roles in this society. I want to introduce to you two texts that I'm going to be referring to throughout the lecture today. One of them was written by Jakob Kotz, uh, and it was called Havelike, or Marriage. And this text was second in popularity only to the Bible in the Dutch Republic in the 17th century. It was a text on the roles of women, starting with maidenhood and ending with widows, and went through all the various stages of a woman's life. And the other text I want to introduce to you is a text by a doctor. His name was Johan von Beverweg, um, and the title translates essentially to On the Excellence of the Female Sex and in which he goes forward to talk about how marvelous women were and about all the great contributions women, uh, that women were making in the Dutch Republic, in this new Dutch Republic. Um, it tells you something about the significance of women then in this society. The other thing I want to set up for you before we get started here is uh, a change now in the role of art. European art up to this point in time had dealt with primarily two types of subject matter. For the most part, either religious themes or themes that uh, were mythological or historical in nature. We're now going to have a whole different sort of patronage and way of making art, however, in the northern, uh, in the Dutch Republic, in the northern part of the Netherlands, in which the church is no longer buying art, right? They don't want art inside the churches. The royalty doesn't have that much power, so they're not commissioning much art. So who's going to be buying art? The middle class. And no longer are we going to have Sistine ceilings painted, but we're going to have tiny works of art for the home, things that you would want to be hung in your homes. Same things we have hanging in our middle class houses today, landscapes, still life, genre, or everyday ordinary types of scenes, uh, portraits, uh, but also lots and lots of prints. The nice thing about prints, uh, if you don't know about making a print, essentially an engraving is made by using a sharp tool to cut into a copper plate, inking it over so that you can create many, many copies of that image. Well, this was cheap, it was affordable, the middle class could collect it and buy it, but in addition to that, broad audiences, okay? So lots of people uh, had art in their homes of one type or, or another. All right, so today we're gonna be dealing with images of women then primarily portraits and what we call genre scenes, or scenes of everyday life. Um, and in particular, one uh, type of genre scene became very popular during this period, um, and that was the domestic genre scene. And I know most of you are probably familiar with Vermeer and uh, those marvelous images of women in the home, which we'll be taking a look at uh, today. Well, I got started on this scholarship uh, over a decade ago, um, I've published uh, probably about uh, six different articles on different aspects of imaging women in the Dutch Republic. And um, about a decade or, uh, and a half ago, a, a book appeared talking about these domestic scenes of the 17th century Dutch Republic as uh, being very demeaning to women, uh, talking about them, uh, women in these images uh, being shown as objects of patriarchal uh, domination. And uh, they would take an image like this one by Caspar Netscher, for example, and say, you see, she's being the humble, obedient housewife doing all the things that are told to her. Uh, she's doing her lace making here. She has her shoes off, which shows she never leaves home. She's just always in the house. And her, uh, she's not looking at us, which shows she's modest and she's humble, and she represents all the pa the virtues uh, of a patriarchal society that was dominating women and telling them how they should act and and how they should behave and so on. I don't think that's what this image is about, and I don't think most of the domestic images are about that kind of demeaning attitude. And uh, so in taking that up, I've researched a number of different attitudes that I think are expressed in these images that reflect a heroic, intelligent, 
strong and significant view of women that existed in the 17th century. And I'm really happy that it's going to be presented now for this Alice Louise Reynolds lecture because I think that's the type of woman she was. And uh, I think that these images are very uh, akin to uh, her own spirit and character. We're going to be taking a look then at three different types of um, female imaging that I have researched over the last decade, heroines, harpies, and housewives. So now we'll get started with our heroines. The heroines that come out of the Dutch Republic um, are, were amazing uh, women, amazing figures. Um, and the most famous of any of these, and indeed she was the most famous hero or heroine to come out of the 17th century Dutch uh, fight for independence, was a woman by the name of Kena Siemens Hasselaar. And she was from Harlem. And very early on, uh, the siege that took place around Harlem by the Spaniards was in 1572 to 1573. And quickly after that, uh, we have images like this that show up in journals of uh, mercenaries who fought in the battle, um, talking about her bravery, talking about how much she helped. Um, and there are frequent accounts of women throwing tar and pitch over the walls onto the Spaniards, throwing rocks at them and so on. Um, in addition to that, she was a widow. Uh, she was 45 years old. She was a widow and uh, uh, had been married to a, a shipbuilder. And so she contributed a lot of wood to help build up the city walls and so on. Her legend grows. Her legend expands. And the myth of Kay now uh, just uh, increases after this point in time. And we have these international types of prints that come out, like this one uh, here uh, uh, by Matthias Quad, which has Latin inscriptions and German inscriptions and Dutch inscriptions to spread her fame throughout Europe. And indeed, the Spaniards writing about this history even talked about this fearsome woman who gathered all of these female warriors. In fact, at one point in time, uh, they start mentioning that she led 300 women to battle and received the title Captain Kenow, as you can see up here above her head, um, and uh, how the, Spaniard sol the Spanish soldiers just flee fled in terror uh, at the sight of these horrifying women. And you'll also notice as we move along here that she's shown grander and more magnificent and more heavily armed almost in every image where she gets a sword, uh, a powder case here, a pistol, uh, and a pike here, uh, shown up on the hill so that she's this magnificent, monumental kind of figure. Um, and, and she just gets grander and grander as we go. And you can see she's not far from representations of male soldiers of male heroes from uh, the revolt. This is actually one of her relatives um, who you can see standing uh, above the city on a hill in a similar kind of fashion uh, with a pike in one hand and a sword and so on. That hand on hip pose, uh, you know, giving a sense of, of strength and power uh, and monumentality and grandeur here in these marvelous poses. So really equating her then with the men uh, who fought in the revolt as well. This is another type of image that became very popular in association with Kano, um, where she was called the Dutch Judith. You remember Judith from the Bible who cut off the head of Holofernes to save the Israelite people? Well, she's shown as doing the same thing with the head of a Spanish general sitting here on her table. Um, and then the inscription underneath uh, basically declares that she is the Dutch uh, Judith, as again, she's very heavily armed. Um, here's another uh, bit more gruesome Judith uh, scene now uh, with the Spaniard uh, general lying dead on the ground, his head chopped off. She holds it up in her hand here, standing again on that hill with the view of Harlem below, the savior of Harlem then. They actually didn't win the siege, but nevertheless, uh, she was seen as, as this great hero. Um, again, Captain Key now, as she is labeled. And again, this is not too far from uh, the male counterpart here, uh, William the First, uh, who was the other uh, great hero of the uh, revolution, uh, shown similarly and similar biblical associations made. He was seen as Moses who saved his people. And you see uh, in 
images of the burning bush and the brazen serpent and so on um, who, led hi, who led the Israelites to safety. He, in the same way, uh, saved his people. And now, instead of the Spanish general's head, you've got his helmet sitting here on, on the table as a sign of his uh, bravery and heroism. All right. This marvelous image that they used for the poster uh, demonstrates that not only were prints made of her, but numerous, numerous paintings made of Kanal Simons Hasselaar. And now she's just armed to the hilt here with her powder horn, her pistol, a couple of different swords, her pike, and a medal uh, showing that she's been rewarded uh, here uh, for her bravery. Uh, these types of images uh, were both nationally patriotic as well as patriotic for the city of Harlem. Uh, we see through the arched opening here in the background the view of the Harlem church. Uh, so it's a sense of pride for Harlem that K now comes from Harlem. As a matter of fact, when you go to visit the city of Harlem today, there's still this magnificent painting of K now in the town hall. It's never been removed um, as, as one of their great uh, uh, forebears. And then the inscription up here is really quite interesting. Um, it says essentially, see, this is K now Simons Hasselaar and uh, she was as brave as a man, and she fought the Spanish tyrant. Uh, so all of these things then equating her bravery to, uh, to the males of her time. So famous in Harlem that they even wrote a play about her, and uh, this uh, mid-17th century play was performed in Harlem with her again uh, saving the day and encouraging the women to fight on to continue with the battle. Now, the key that shows how, how famous a heroine she became, what a significant figure she was in Dutch history, is a book that comes out uh, mid-17th uh, century by Van Gelre, who writes about the heroes and heroines of the Netherlandish past. First portrait, the first image uh, represented in this book is William the First. Second is Kanal Simons Hasselaar. So even by this uh, point in the 17th century, uh, she was greatly lauded, uh, uh, an awe-inspiring uh, type of figure. She wasn't the only one, though. Uh, every, uh, several other cities in the Netherlands uh, developed their own heroine out of the revolution. And this one's name is Trent van Leemputz from the city of Utrecht. And uh, this inscription tells us, this is a 17th century painting of her, uh, but this inscription tells us that essentially uh, she uh, was so brave that she went out and did what the soldiers didn't dare do uh, or the burghers didn't dare do, which was to destroy the Spanish castle of Bradenburg. And so we see these women all gathered here in the background with all their household implement tongs and pots and brooms and things. Um, and here is Trin with her uh, pickaxe and the brick that she takes out of the castle here uh, as they destroy this Spanish fortress. And again, that arched opening indicating the location. This is Utrecht, and we're proud of our own heroine here uh, by the name of Trin van Leemputz. Trin van Leemputz was so popular uh, that in Beverweyck's text, now you remember he's the one who writes this book on the excellence of the female tech, uh, on the, uh, on the excellence of the female sex, greatly lauds her. Not only does he talk about her going and destroying the castle with this image, but he also talks about a Spanish soldier who dared to invade her house and she came tearing after him and beat him up and uh, scared him out of the house and so on. But once again, we see her with all her women with their household implements and so on, tools and so on, uh, going out to destroy uh, the castle of uh, Freidenberg. Um, Alkmaar uh, was another place that was besieged, and uh, here again we have the history, uh, history is telling us about how brave the women were and how bravely they fought. By the 17th century, they picked out one by the name of Trin Rembrandt, uh, who you see depicted here, very much like those images of Kay. Now Simon's Hasselhaar, right? Uh, we want to have our own heroine, and so she uh, then becomes the heroine of Alkmaar, and you can still see this image in the Alkmaar uh, Museum today. Uh, Weberweit goes on, however, to talk about women throughout the Dutch Republic uh, who fought very bravely in the revolt. For example, the women of Amsterdam who are illustrated here, who after several men had fallen came and manned the cannons and continued to fight on 
uh, bravely against the Spaniards, but he continues to mention all of these different women who fought in the revolt, uh, who dressed up as soldiers and uh, continued fighting against the, the Spaniards. Now, truce wasn't really declared, and they constantly are having uh, outbreaks of, of battles again with the Spaniards uh, for several decades, and the final peace is not signed until 1648. All right, so you get the sense then of how many women are involved in this. Now, this did not stop even after the Peace of Westphalia in 1648. And there's been this really interesting historical study that has been written about what an, an, a unique phenomena takes place in the Netherlands in that women continued throughout the 17th century to dress up like soldiers, to go to battle uh, later against the English and the other enemies uh, of the Netherlands, um, and so that these women really seem to have inspired the whole succeeding generations of females in the Netherlands uh, to continue to fight for the fatherland, for the republic. All right, it's not only the heroism of these soldiers, these military figures, however, that is really interesting about women in the Dutch Republic. Uh, there are also women who became highly educated and performed rather heroic deeds themselves. And perhaps the most famous of all of these was a woman by the name of Anne Maria von Schurman. Anne Maria von Schurman went to the University of Utrecht. Amazing for the 17th century. Women did not go to university. She had to sit behind a curtain, but nevertheless, she went to the university. Um, and she uh, was uh, fluent in 12 languages. She was an artist. She was a musician. She was a poetess. Uh, she wrote several philosophical uh, uh, treatises, um, and she was just greatly praised by um, a lot of the males of her generation. She was such a phenomena uh, that people came from France, from England, from all over Europe just to see her, just to visit her, um, because she was uh, such an amazing and heroic uh, type of, of woman. You can see here in this self-portrait uh, that she does that she uses a similar kind of format to what we'd seen with those heroine images. This arched uh, opening uh, with a view of the Utrecht Cathedral out here, and now on her table she has her instruments of heroism, books, uh, books and paper and treatises and pens and so on. Um, and uh, this was a dedication page to Jakob Katz's text. And you remember I told you how popular that book was. You've got to keep that in mind. But this is spreading out to everybody now who sees this extremely famous, learned uh, woman uh, by the name of Anne Maria von Sherman. And he goes on for several pages to praise her. Johann von Beverweyck also dedicates his text on the excellence of the female sex to Anne Maria von Sherman. So she becomes this extremely famous uh, individual and lots of females trying to emulate her here. And here's some good examples. Uh, this is another woman by the name of Ra Margarete van Goerweyck who was from Dordrecht. And you see her church outside her window here to uh, show the fame of Dordrecht. And this is the frontispiece to a book on Dordrecht. And, um, and uh, not only is the image comparable to what we just saw with Anna Maria von Sherman in trying to emulate her, but he goes on to praise her for several verses, talking about the languages she's learned and how she's become an artist. And this was done after a self-portrait that she had made. Um, and not only that, she's as great as Anna Maria von Sherman. You know, so it's this competition between the cities then to show they have just as heroic a woman uh, as these other places. Um, that continues with a woman by the name of Joanna Courten Block, who was a very famous artist at the end of the century who paper cut made paper cut designs, which we don't particularly consider a fine art form today, but they're amazingly intricate works of art, um, became very famous. And here she has herself portrayed with, guess who? Anna Maria von Sherman. And the inscription down here below, again, equates her abilities and her talents with Anna Maria von Sherman. And almost a whole century has gone by from that first image that we saw. So you see how lasting this legacy is now, how important this connection uh, between these generations of women uh, was. Here's a portrait of her in an uh, artist's biography that comes out at the end of the century in which several women are included. Um, uh, Gershaw Rogman, who we're going to talk about, Anna Maria von Sherman, and Joanna Gordon Block. 
uh, is only one of three artists who gets a whole page illustration of herself and trumpeting her fame here, Laura being crowned with a laurel wreath. I mean, these are the aspects uh, of heroes. Another woman included Maria Sibylla Marion, who goes to the West Indies, lives in these horrible primitive uh, uh, circumstances to document the flora and fauna of the West Indies, and she comes back and publishes these books. So uh, many, many heroic, famous women coming out of this era. One last type of portrait that I'd like to deal with is the portrait of uh, Regentesses. Um, the, all the charitable organizations had to be taken over uh, it civically uh, once uh, the Calvinist church uh, came uh, to power in the Netherlands. And so well-to-do middle-class uh, individuals uh, became the caretakers then of homes for the elderly and orphanages and so on. And in the um, entryways to these institutions, you would see these portraits then of uh, the people who ran these institutions, both males and females. And again, there's a sort of equality there um, in which you see these um, powerful, strong, and yet I think very benevolent uh, kinds of figures in, these, uh, in this portrait of the Regentesses for the old men's home where Franz Hals, the artist here, uh, lived in, his, in the later stages of his life. So many, many images then of powerful uh, women coming out during this period. Now, because of all these glorifying images, you would assume, well, everybody just thought very well of the women of this era and, uh, and that they had this very strong, powerful uh, effect in society. Um, there was, however, an antithesis to this of uh, obviously males who were rather threatened <laughs> by all of this uh, power of women. Um, and we have a number of images, now moving to our next category, harpies, uh, that deal with satirizing the power of women. Well, there's no need to satirize that power if women don't have any power. So again, I think it is a sort of underscoring of the fact that uh, they were seen to be kind of threatening uh, to uh, certain individuals in this society. And one of the favorite sort of representations of this is what we call the topsy-turvy world or the upside-down world type prints like you see here. Uh, where you have uh, animals driving plows pulled by human beings, or you have children feeding their parents or spanking them or carrying them. Um, and paramount in these images were women who dressed up like soldiers while men stayed at home and spun, or women soldiers who you know, stormed the castle here. So a direct relevance to all of these heroine images that we've just been looking at. Uh, in terms of saying, hey, this is a world gone haywire where women are on top and they shouldn't be, um, kind of an idea. Now, right after the revolution, there are a number of histories that come out that talk about Kano, and she's a national hero by this point in time, so you can't really uh, criticize her, but what they would do is they would say, now Kano, she was great, but all these other women who were following along in her footsteps we're not so sure about. Uh, an, an individual by the name of de, Ver, de Viver uh, writes a book uh, in the early part of the century where he says, yeah, Kano was great and she really saved the day, but wouldn't you really hate to be married to a woman like that? That was his conclusion, uh, essentially. Uh, so obviously a kind of fear of that. But then on the other hand, there's an interesting art author by the name of de Vries writing at the end of the century who has this whole debate going on between two men in his text in which one man takes the side of, oh, I'd hate to be married to you know a, a strong woman and Kano was okay, but we just don't want those kind of strong women anymore. And the other one keeps arguing, no, women are great and look at the marvelous examples of heroic women and then points to Queen Elizabeth, the Queen of England, and says, look at what a marvelous job she did for England, you know, and, and so this kind of debate continuing on throughout the century. Well, it shouldn't surprise you then that we have gangs of battling violent females uh, shown in a lot of images after this point in time. Uh, this is one called The Upper Hand, where you have uh, women who are bullying their husbands, beating them up, carrying this overhand banner to say, now we have the upper hand. Um, several metaphors for female power here. This man forced to take off his trousers and put him on his wife while she holds the upper hand, you know, has her fist above him. And we still have that expression today, who wears the pants in the family, right? Uh, kind of an idea. 
Uh, this man, this was the, the uh, a absolute epitome here of the sign that you've submitted to the power of your wife, the kiss of the thumb. So she puts her thumb out and shows her domination over her husband. And then we have women beating their husbands with tongs and so on as the men are forced to take on female chores like spinning and so on um, to show how dangerous uh, powerful women are. Um, this is another, this is a text called The Upside Down World in which uh, we have all these violent women using their spitting, <laughs> spitting tools and their shoes and their fists and so on, all fighting each other. And what are they fighting for? A pair of man's trousers, which this guy here in the foreground has given up as they're all trying to struggle now for power uh, in the society. Um, here's another type of image where uh, the woman grabs her yelling husband uh, by the hair. She's already won uh, one leg of the pri prize trousers here while he's trying to keep his leg in the other, uh, in the other half. Um, here's another one, a man uh, dressing his wife in the trousers as she puts out her thumb for the kiss and uh, raises her fist to show that she has the upper hand. These were very popular in proverb prints, and this whole print series, this whole series of prints, uh, proverbs, uh, is named after this battle for the trousers here, as we see scenes of bad Greek. Greek was the name given to shrewish, overbearing housewives. Bad Greek putting on her husband's trousers as he puts on the skirt. These are more women fighting over the trousers here. And this was another sign of male submission. Uh, essentially, the proverb reads, he takes care of the egg while the hen goes walking. In other words, the man's left at home to take care of the children while she goes out into public. Um, and uh, this developed a whole new thing called the henna taster. And we have just numerous, numerous in images of henna tasters. Um, these were men who, ha who had given a power and authority over to their wives. You see her putting on the trousers in the background while he gropes the hen, feeling for its eggs, which was a female task. And so it shows uh, that he's been you know, uh, forced to do those female chores. Sometimes they're shown scrubbing the floor. This was an image called man's verdrit, or man's misery, as his wife sits nearby with the tongs ready to beat him at any moment. Uh, and here's another one of the woman forcing her husband to spin. And you can see who's the instigator of all of this evil. It's the devil, right, uh, who's prompting her into uh, this evil domination. Um, then by the end of the 17th century, we have a whole comic strip that begins to appear called Jan de Wasser, or John the Washer is essentially the way that translates, where John uh, courts his wife, they get married, they come home, she falls down, gets angry, starts to beat him, takes his pants, and then beats him uh, while he's cooking and taking care of the child, and, and then this foreboding image that John's going to have to be under her subjection forever after that, okay? So these numerous, numerous images of violent, fighting, battling women, I think, are very much <laughs> a product of all of this attention given to the heroic women uh, throughout the 17th century uh, from, the, uh, from the revolt. So we have these two points of view, but nevertheless, I think it, it does demonstrate that women did have power in the society uh, and, and a power that some feared was getting out of control, out of hand. Now we finally come to our last uh, section, uh, the housewife images. And I want to say that I think this is another side to the same coin in which um, as I said, uh, uh, most feminist scholars have looked at these images and talked about how uh, patriarchal they are, how they show female submission, how, uh, how uh, they encourage humility and virtue and so on in women in terms of staying at home and, and um, doing all of those patriarchally prescribed roles. I don't think, however, that that's the point of these images, and I don't think women of the time would have seen them in that light at all. I'm starting here with the frontispiece to Jakob Katz's text, Havelik, or Marriage, in order to remind us that how much attention was paid to women's lives, how much attention was paid to those different roles that they played throughout their lives, that this was the most popular text. It many. It goes through many editions every decade, <laughs> uh, is how popular this, this text is. It, it's an amazing, uh, amazingly popular text. Now, who's going to buy, buy this text? Are a whole lot of men going to be buying this text on the roles of women? 
you figure it's got to be mostly women who are buying this book, right? Um, and I think in the same way, women were buying images about themselves, about their lives in the domestic sphere. Um, domesticity only got a bad name after the feminist movement. In other words, it was seen as something of low status and un unimportant and insignificant. But I think in Dutch society, it was an extremely important role. After all, these were the one; these were the people who are now going to be educating and bringing up a whole new generation of citizenry that needed to be schooled in uh, in democracy and how to to run this new society, this merchant. Uh, middle-class uh, society. Uh, this society, in part, does it, that owes its uh, golden age to the fact that it was a very uh, significant and powerful uh, trading force in Europe, uh, but it also had, of course, the East Indies Company, the West Indies com uh, Company. Uh, they became a very well-to-do nation. Um, and it's an interesting thing that women became increasingly educated. Foreigners who come to visit the Netherlands are just astounded that the women act in business, uh, particularly because their husbands are gone for long periods of time uh, away from home. And uh, he talks. many of these foreigners talk about how well-versed the women are in accounts and keeping accounts and so on. Um, and so they're having to do double duty and uh, act in the home, uh, but also run the family business uh, as well. The literacy rate is higher than anywhere else in Europe. Um, at the beginning of the century, uh, the literacy rate for, rate for women is about 30%. By, by mid-century, it's about 60%. Whereas in countries like England, which you would uh, think were rather similar to the Netherlands at this time, the literacy rate for women was about 10%. So that shows you, I think, uh, the significant attention paid to women in this society. My favorite artist, Gertrude Rockman. Now, I want to talk to you about a series of prints that she does on roles of uh, on women in domestic chores and so on. Um, and I'm just going to show you three of them. She starts to do these images before any male artists are making domestic images, before Vermeer, before de Hoogh, before any of those artists that might come to mind here. About mid-century, then, she comes out with this totally unique series. This had not been a popular subject matter in painting or in prints up to this point in time. And in fact, hers are the only prints of this type, of these domestic sorts of scenes. And they are amazingly modern. You, you almost feel like it's a photograph, like you've just walked in and taken a photo of these women at work. And for a moment, it takes you a while to figure out what it is she's actually doing. She's making pancakes, a favorite Dutch treat, right? <laughs> uh, and she's got her skillet here. She's got her bowl of batter. Here's a pancake lying in the plate. But she's not, it's not a how-to book, like women, you, this is how you make a pancake. It's not a sort of uh, uh, telling you these are the things you should be doing. It is a sense of, I'm busy with my work, and I have no time for you as the viewer. And she covers up her work here. She's so involved, and she makes us interested in it because she's so absorbed in what she is doing here. She's a formidable woman. She's a powerful presence in this image. There's nothing weak or dominated about her. And the same with the other images. This is a marvelous image of a woman spinning. You don't know how unusual this is to see somebody from the back. If you think about earlier paintings than this, of course, they're always looking at you, addressing you, looking forward. That averted gaze isn't one of humility and I'm shy. It is a sense of, look at how significant my work is, and I'm absorbed with that work. And she directs your attention to the fact that she is spinning here and caring for her child. And she always includes, then, those objects that a woman would know are simply for that particular task her skeins here, her nitty natty, her spools, her pick, all the things that one would need uh, for spinning. And then this marvelously, I think, heroic and strong and rigorous. These, these are not frail females. Uh, the arduousness of this task of bending over and scouring all this metalware here. Uh, she's working on a plate, and these are the things she's already uh, shined to perfection. Uh, but she is a, a, a well-muscled figure here, very busy uh, at her task. Well, these images, we know that Gertrude Rogman was dead by 1652, come before any of these other artists start doing them, and they all start to copy her. 
Okay, so I'm just going to quick go through some of these. Essentially, Casper Netcher's uh, work that we would started out with here, where I told you how m frequently now this is seen as this image of uh, male domination, copies Gertrude Rogman's composition in reverse. Same slapback chair, same cap, same jacket, essentially. Only now she's doing uh, lace making here. But again, she directs our attention to the significance. Have you ever been to the lace makers in Belgium or the Netherlands to watch them work? It is a fascinating process. I mean, they go, get going so fast, you don't know how they could possibly keep track of this. It is a skill. It is a, a highly trained skill, um, and it's amazing work that they do. Uh, here's Peter de Hoek, a famous uh, genre domestic uh, artist, uh, and here you see him copying her view uh, of the spinner. Or, for example, Vrel, uh, who then starts to paint these back views of women uh, seated before hearths, uh, very much in the same fashion of Gertrude Rochman, or this one of a woman bending over uh, in front of a large casement window, again, very much related to Gertrude Rochman. So these images of Vermeer, do they stem from patriarchy and moralizing to women, stay in the household, and these are the things you should be doing? No, they are powerful women. They are doing significant tasks, taking care of the home, which was so important to Dutch culture, so valued by this culture, by this middle class culture. And the woman then such an important part uh, of, uh, of that, uh, that new ideology uh, of the Dutch Republic. Uh, this is Vermeer's uh, Woman Pouring Milk. Here's his lace maker, where again, how you just want to look at the lace making that she's doing. She directs all of our attention to this extremely intricate task here uh, that she is working on. Then numerous, numerous images of women and children like Gertrude Rogman had done, um, taking care of what seems to be a sick child, feeding her here with a, a, a pot, uh, and how important a role that was for women in this culture. And then uh, I've just begun working on women as consumers. Uh, an article appeared uh, fairly recently talking about how Dutch women never left the household and, and wouldn't have dared go out on the streets and so on. And uh, so what I've begun working on is this extremely important um, role that women play as consumers and how uh, significant that is in a culture that imports goods like, for example, pomegranates uh, from tropical locales. Um, uh, and so influences then imports and the economics and so on of the entire society. Um, and again, I think these were images being bought by women. This is what I do. This is who I am. And I love the fact that across the street here, as you can see in this detail, a woman's looking out of her half door to watch the woman over on the other side of the street buying the pomegranates. And in that way, they, they are reflecting each other. And so that this is a celebration of us and who we are and what we do. You buy this image to hang in your home because it is a reflection of me and my roles. Uh, women who were constantly out in the street, out in the public sphere. Here's a woman directing a tailor saying, this is how you're going to mend this jacket and this is what needs to be done here. Um, and, and the importance then of, uh, uh, of that economic aspect of women's role. Women who did run businesses and shops and stores and so on, um, and who were very skilled from what we understand uh, in the, these business uh, types of affairs. Women who ran the household, told servants what to do, shopkeepers uh, what they needed, um, very efficient then um, in controlling and ordering their households. But it's not just scenes of female tasks. This is another, I think, indication that these were not just morals telling women this is what you should be doing. There are these marvelous moments of, for example, this captivating introspection here by Vermeer, a woman lost in thought as she opens the window or this image by De Vita of a woman playing at a harpsichord. Uh, this woman reading, uh, for example, by Ellingdon, again reminding us of those high literacy rates uh, of Dutch women. So it, it, these domestic scenes are not all just about moralizing and telling women you need to perform these household kinds of tasks. And I want to end with this image today. Um, uh, it, it, it looks like a domestic genre scene, but actually it's a portrait. Uh, a woman by the name of Adriana von Husten, who, I, who obviously decided this is what I want my portrait to be like. I want to have myself shown out shopping. Okay, so we got to think about why that would be the choice. 
Now, Adriana von Husten uh, had this done by an artist by the name of De Witte. And De Witte was living at the von Husten household. And um, he left during the night and actually took this portrait with him when he left. And she sued him to get this portrait back, which shows you how much she valued it and probably determined the way that it was going to be represented and obviously loved this portrayal of herself. Um, it is heroic. It is the heroic housewife bringing the two together here as she now uh, represents everything that is Dutch from the middle class nature of women going out and taking care of their own households and shopping for the fish, teaching her little girl over here in her shadow uh, how to shop as well. And we have women running the marketplace also. Uh, it brings up that sort of Calvinist uh, work ethic and middle class kind of background. Uh, but also the Dutch uh, maritime trade and interest in the ocean with all the fish lay laying out here. She's displaying what is Dutch and that I'm a heroic housewife of this Dutch Republic 17th century golden age culture and I don't think there's any man who was going to tell her what to do. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.